Well, thank you, Jeff Bradshaw, for joining us today. You are a senior research scientist at the uh, Florida Institute for Human and Machine Cognition in Pensacola, Florida. But beyond that, you are heavily involved in the Latter-day Saint scholarship world. You're a vice president for the Interpreter Foundation. You are involved with Book of Mormon Central and producing content on the Book of Moses and have published quite a few articles and books as well. So we're really grateful to have you. But to understand why we're doing this book, Hugh Nibley Observed, could you just describe who was Hugh Nibley and why should people care about him? It's a great question because uh, he's somebody who passed away, gee, 15, more than 15 years ago. And so there's people who've never heard of him or people who've only heard stories about him and never read anything about him. But for me, he was a really seminal influence. I would say, if I had to say in a nutshell, he's arguably the most brilliant Latter-day Saint scholar of the 20th century. And um, you, if you look just at this volume of writings he did on history, on social issues, and on religion, of course, that fills a very large uh, bookshelf here at uh, Book of Mormon Central, plus probably at least that much of unpublished writings. And I'll just mention here that we're trying to work uh, together on collecting some of those up in an online bibliography and making some of those materials have been hard to get more accessible. Um, I think, though, um, the thing that uh, makes him uh, really stand out more than anything else is the fact that he was not only an interesting writer, witty, entertaining, trenchant, and, and uh, cut to the heart of issues, and a wide range of issues. He knew a lot of languages. He had to do things um, in the original languages. He didn't, there weren't as many English translations of, of standard works as there are now. But he also was a very interesting person. And so I think another reason that uh, we're people will be interested in him today is because of how he, the, the example he set of an individual and various kinds of things and the kind of stories that we try to set out that are behind his famous writings. Perfect. Hugh Nibley Observed is a celebration of Hugh Nibley's life in a lot of ways. So what was your role in putting this volume together? Well, um, I, I was the, it was the, really the collaboration of a lot of people, but I think that the, the core of the book and the start for me was the rediscovery of a set of recordings from 2010 that the Maxwell Institute made and generously uh, let us use of a set of centennial lectures on Hugh Nibley that were given at that time, the 100th year, year of his birth. He'd already been uh, passed away five years earlier. And uh, a couple had been published. And there were three maybe videos online, but other than that, it was really, um, I didn't really re realize that the rest of those lectures existed. So putting those together, uh, it just seemed like a natural uh, and great retrospective. One uh, scholar and, and person very interested in his, his work told me it felt good to him because it was a kind of a closure on some of the things that he'd done. Added to that, those uh, number of lectures, there were people who maybe should have been or could have been included in that lecture series but weren't, and they were eager to contribute. And then the family, as they got more involved, some of the family members were involved in the centennial lectures, um, it became possible to include his funeral service. And I had never, I wasn't here when that happened, I wasn't aware of it, I wasn't aware that there was any record that existed. But to me, even as someone who's read so much about Hugh Nibley over the years, it opened up a new window on his personal and family life and on the affection that his children had for him in a lot of different ways and from a lot of different perspectives. They're each very diverse individuals and wonderful and brilliant. And uh, it was neat to see what they had to say. Plus, I, I really enjoyed hearing the audio and vi video version of Jack Welch's uh, article, Hugh Nibley's article of faith, where he tried to pull everything together. Elder Dallin H. Oaks uh, generously, again, uh, let us use his beautiful sermon, I think, that closed out uh, in a very appropriate way those funeral services. When we got to that port part, it seemed clear that there were other people who had more personal reminiscences, too, that should have been concluded. So the first part, uh, you know, uh, of the core of the Centennial Lectures was about his scholarship. The second part was about him as a man. And so... Um, Included in that was, were recollections by some of his editors and colleagues and friends, Don Norton, Steve Ricks. And on top of that, this huge BYU folklore collection uh, that Jane Brady put together. Uh, all the stories that you could ever wish uh, that are maybe true, whether or not they're really true. 
And so that's how the book came together. Wow. And uh, it's, it's interesting because this book, Hunebly Observed, is not quite a biography and it's not quite an anthology. It seems to be a, a patchwork of a few things. So to summarize, you mentioned that some of these chapters are coming from his centennial celebration. Some are coming from uh, his funeral service and others are coming from just other voices and reminiscences that weren't covered in those other places. Uh, are there any, anything else we're missing? What other components uh, could create this book? Well, we open, uh, and I, I think that should be mentioned, with a th set of three portraits of Hugh Nibley. Uh, the first one, which is a beautiful uh, uh, opening to a program that Jack Welch did back in 1970, no, 1985, when the film The Faith of an Observer premiered. Uh, we'll maybe mention that later, but if anybody is out there and hasn't seen that film, they should really see it. It's, it's beautifully done. But at that, at that thing, he talked about Hugh Nibley as a doorkeeper to the house of the Lord. And that, uh, I think, was so appropriate a terminology for him, not only because of his focus on the temple, which is where we have the ultimate door of the Lord. And, and as Jack concluded his article, he said he doesn't just stand by any doors. But it also proved to be a very personal, I think, statement for many of us who, for whom he opened up a doorway to an understanding of scriptures and spiritual dimensions of the gospel we hadn't seen. That portrait then is followed by a physical portrait that Rebecca Everett uh, talks about. Uh, she has a very beautiful portrait. You can see it in the Harold Beely Library in a reading room that's appropriately named after Hugh Nibley. And it contains a lot of the interesting visual symbols of his work and his life. And uh, she exults and exudes enthusiasm over the very touched reaction he had as he saw that painting. And I think it, it's a very appropriate tribute to him. That was personally my favorite chapter of the whole book. And it's a fairly short one, but I loved it because that was my only personal connection to Hugh Nibley is I remember spending lots of hours in the Hugh Nibley ancient studies reading room at the library. And there's this huge portrait of him there. And as classmates in our program, we would always just kind of joke that, well, I guess Hugh Nibley is the patron saint of ancient studies for <laughs> Latter-day Saints because you've got this portrait there with a hypocephalus behind him, but to us it looked like a halo, like he was being uh, deified or sanctified. And uh, there's also a bust of Hugh Nibley and a giant uh, facsimile too there, and so there's a little shrine. And so, and, but I never knew the story behind that artwork because there's no plaque there or anything like that. And so reading that chapter, just seeing all the different elements that really create a beautiful portrait of Hugh Nibley and a tribute to everything that he worked on in his life. I, it was very satisfying for me and, you know, a little personally like, oh yeah, I know what they're talking about for once in this whole book. <laughs> well, I hope now, you know, those, all those little things that you started to realize will just be there. That is a really cool story. I thought you were going to tell me you were there for the actual dedication of the room, but no. then I thought back, <laughs> that would have been a little... Too I'm early for you. pretty young for most things connecting to Hugh Nibley, so it's been really inspiring and exciting to hear stories from you and Jack Welch and others about their experiences because I feel like I'm getting connected to my intellectual predecessor. Hugh Nibley is in such a large way a pioneer for Latter-day Saint scholarship, and so it's, it's good to go back to those roots and reflect on how important he was. Um, and and if, I, if I could say something, my favorite chapter there, uh, since you've shared your favorite, is really his intellectual history, which is the third portrait of him there. And he gives it himself a self-portrait. And I'm really glad we had permission to use that because it gives you a little bit of a sample of how witty and how um, self-deprecating and how interesting his life was. Why does that mean a lot to me? Well, it's because I guess I could identify him even when I was when I was younger. I was kind of a different kind of guy and I liked books a lot and I read all the fine print in the improvement eras, you know, when I was, you know, maybe eight to ten years old and enjoyed it. And then later on in the Ensign and the New Era, and of course my grandfather, when he passed away, he left a copy of Lehigh in the Desert for him for it in my mom and dad's library, and they probably read it, but I probably read it more times than anybody else in the household. There was something there that spoke to me. I felt that he would be somebody, even though I had no hope of ever meeting him at that, that age, that who, who would understand the feelings I had towards Scripture, how reverently I felt, how much I knew it was a, you know, historic, and it, it actually happened, 
and the great feelings of love that I felt for the prophets who were there. I felt that coming through and I didn't find it in the other writings I had except for, of course, the scriptures themselves I loved. And so that intellectual history, I guess I related on two levels. I, I sort of enjoyed to watch his journey through opening up to these things in a much uh, grander way than I could ever imagine myself. But in a way, it was kind of a... Uh, 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 it told kind of my story in terms of, of opening up to the wonderful things that we can find in Scripture and in the temple, which is where he ends and where uh, I think much of my interest has ended up too. It's remarkable and uh, I, I appreciate that perspective. I came to Hugh Nibley quite late. I mean, I was an adult before I started reading any of his works. And because of that, I think I brought a lot of preconceived notions of what Nibley was supposed to be and what he was. and. I was really refreshed with his writing style and he was witty, but also went on tangents and was a storyteller. And it was a very different way of reading than I was used to and reading academic articles and things like that. And so it was, it was refreshing. And so reading that chapter, his own autobiography portrait was quite lovely to see this very human scholar and uh, get to explore his, his thoughts, his, his life and what he thought of the gospel and he, his testimony was just so strong. It's, it's inspiring in so many ways. Absolutely, absolutely. So you've already talked about this a little bit, but what's one way that Hugh Nibley has influenced your life and work? Well, it's, it's interesting. I, I, uh, I'm a scientist by profession, still um, involved in artificial intelligence, cognitive science, kind of getting the human and the machine together in, in that way. And uh, because of how rapidly things are coming together uh, in that field, I'm constantly throwing away insights every day. If I don't keep up reading every day, you know, it's, uh, I'm, I'm going to be way mm -hmm. behind. And it's, uh, so you've got to stay ahead of the curve. And, and the thing that's nice to me, I guess just in terms of my personal life, reading Nibley and, and the scriptures hand in hand, is that I feel like I'm continually building through my own experiences and through my study and through prayer on past things. I don't have to throw away anything I learn because I'm really learning eternal truths that way. And of course, in the temple, you're experiencing even more than anywhere else on earth, a bit of eternity. So if I had to say that, sort of the personal satisfaction is saying, I'm not just keeping up with the Joneses every day, I'm actually building something that's gonna last forever. Um, in terms of, of that knowledge. I know that your main work focuses a lot on the Book of Moses and also on mm -hmm. temple work. And so would you say that Hugh Nibley was very influential in that particular part of your scholarship? I would certainly say so, yeah. I've, I've had the privilege of uh, spending a lot of time on the Book of Moses uh, for now, gee, almost two decades, <laughs> I guess, if I go back to start. But actually it goes back even further. I used to love as a young boy reading, especially the story of the stories of Genesis. I can't say exactly why, except for it, it just seemed to resonate with me. The stories of, of family, you know, you, you get the whole picture there and you get the good and the bad and the, but, but I loved the characters such as Abraham and others who were so faithful and they had such a love for the Lord. And that stuck with me. And, and uh, so I had never imagined I'd do this, but I was impressed when we went overseas, uh, gee, uh, well, I guess 2005, um, to bring, I think I had maybe 60 or 70 boxes of books that we shipped over with everything right. else, all the rest of our stuff to France when I was there on a sort of a, an unexpected sabbatical. And I felt impressed to go ahead and write down some of the things that, um, that I'd been thinking about for a long time about Genesis and the book of Moses. and. Um, I was going to start out just talking about the story of Joseph, uh, which I loved so much, and the story of forgiveness and the wonderful personal stories there. But something kept drawing me back to the first chapters of, of, the, of the Bible and, and of Moses, which was just absolutely intimidating to me because you have to deal with, every culture has its stories of the beginnings. Every culture has beautiful music and artwork. Uh, full of the, the head, headwaters of philosophy and theology all start out with those early stories and literally the waters of, of, of the flood, I guess. And uh, so it was a great comfort to me that Nibley, although he didn't flesh out every angle and sweep every corner of the room when it comes to 
to uh, to uh, to all the issues involved in those books. He explored, at least got a flashlight in a lot of corners that I never would have discovered without that. And so it was a comfort to say, you know, Kilroy was here, Nibley was there, so I could say, okay, at least I have a starting point. <laughs> and sometimes it was flashes, like the connection to the temple. I've become convinced, and, and I think there's more scholarship now than ever, that there's a profound relationship through all, not just the first stories of the creation and the fall, but through the redemption of mankind up through Enoch, a close connection through the temple. I never would have discovered that without Hugh Nibley. People fault him and people find him controversial because he didn't sweep every corner and cross every T and dot every I. But I think he felt he was in a hurry all his life. And I'm sure he had a sense of his own mission. And to me, his mission for me was in opening up the way to discover things that I never would have discovered. And I know that's true for so many of us. That's why, in addition to having that scholarly respect, those of us who study his writings find him to be a true friend and, and mentor. And I think he fulfilled his mission beautifully in that regard, even though um, some may take issues with his thoroughness. Mm -hmm. He certainly went a lot of places and did a lot of things that helped a lot of us. I'm less familiar with your history with farms and previous organizations. Did you personally know Hugh Nibley? I did. I was at BYU in... Uh, 1979, 1980, I, uh, I went there and, uh, well, I won't go into more deep history about that, but, uh, but during the time I was there, I had already come with this sort of childhood and teenage interest in Hugh Nibley, so you can bet that every class I could attend, I had a pretty full schedule, mm -hmm. and every um, uh, bit of paper I could pick up, uh, I did, and, and read as much as I could. I had a good friend, Mike James, there that handed me a lot of published and unpublished stuff which I just dropped off today at Steve Whitlock's house, uh, one of the editors, to be scanned uh, for, the, uh, for, the, for the bibliography because I had a lot of access to a lot of things through Mike and other places that hadn't been done. So that uh, was a key and pivotal moment for me before I went on to further graduate studies elsewhere. I thought I was going to stay at BYU. Everybody said, if you don't get your degree out of state, you'll never get to come back to Utah. So I went out of state to grad school and never made it back here. <laughs> <laughs> so it goes. So it goes. But that year where I could watch things firsthand was uh, and uh, become more familiar firsthand was really influential on me. Wow. Even though I don't have any crazy stories to offer like sure. some of our other friends do. My only story is about knowing what that painting is. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, you mentioned one of the critiques of Hugh Nibley was that he didn't always dot his I's or cross his D's. Another critique is that his scholarship's outdated now and that a lot of other scholarship has come out since then. Um, but uh, what would you, why would you say Hugh Nibley is important for scholars uh, and Latter-day Saints today to know and understand? Well, let me ta talk about ordinary Latter-day Saints first and, and for people like me. And maybe I'm repeating a theme I've said before, but... I think he was a model Latter-day Saint. And of course, he was very different in lots of ways, but maybe I still identify him with because I kind of feel kind of different in a lot of ways. He knew how to stood, stand out for what he believed against a background, and that's become especially clear as I've gotten into some of his correspondence here. I've only, we've only been able to include a couple of letters in there. But it was clear that when he was speaking to people who about you know, some subject, he, he wrote a letter, she mentioned one to Jacob Neusner about a very famous scholar, perhaps maybe he's written more volumes even than Isaac Asimov. I don't know if he's over a thousand by the time he finished his career. Very well known and reputed scholar in, in Jewish studies. And he, um, he uh, thanked him for an article he wrote, Nibley did, when he wrote back to Neusner. And he said, by the way, even more interesting than that, or something that effect is, what I've been finding out about the Book of Mormon and the book Pearl of Great Price <laughs> is even more interesting. Wow. Signed, Hugh Nibley, more or less. <laughs> and that, to me, impresses me that he was willing to stand out and bear his testimony in those circumstances. Why, does, why, why is that relevant to us today? Because in his day, there were many more people who just took for granted their belief in God and the authenticity of the Bible. Uh, today, the number of people, even Latter-day Saints, who question the historicity of the Bible or even the existence of some of the major biblical characters is, is much larger. 
So if we look at that, the importance of that, we can say that now more than ever, it's important to continue the momentum that he started. Why is that important? Why is it important that the Book of Mormon is a story of some things that happened in, um, you know, some place in the world? I won't stick my neck out here as to where, because I know that's controversial. Why is it important that Abraham was there and a Moses was there and that he, they went through some more things there that we read in the Bible? I'm not saying there isn't document behind document behind document of what we have in the Bible, but... Um, if we deny their historicity, if we deny that they were real people, then we also deny the fact that Joseph Smith said he visited these individuals and that he received priesthood keys from them. It strikes at the very heart of the church. On the other hand, if we take the leads that Hugh Nibley opened up towards looking at the Book of Mormon in its cultural, social, and historical setting. Lehi in the Desert is still a classic written 70 years ago, and I think it's still a lot of people's favorite Book of Mormon book. He opened our eyes to, to somehow make it as real as possible so that we could begin to believe that, or it makes it plausible uh, that these things are true. Of course, we can't get our source of testimony from these writings. In my opinion, though, um, scholarship allied with testimony is much stronger than either scholarship or testimony alone. And the nice thing about Hugh Nibley is that it was very apparent in his ca case, as, as you were talking about, right? When you read his scholarly writings, he'll just pop up with something that just <laughs> says, you know, he's actually taking this stuff seriously, and he was. And so I hope and expect that that's going to be important to people today because more than ever we need people who are willing to understand the Book of Mormon in its historical context not only because it's the foundation of its uh, of our beliefs but also it it makes it helps my understanding of that great book and also we need people of testimony and Hugh Nibley was really a model in getting those two things together for me and I know for many others and I hope many others discover it I think that's very important that he was not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need more bold testimony in a conjunction with scholarship. I mean, that's what being a disciple scholar is all about, is being Christ-like in behavior, but also being forthright and intellectually honest about where you're coming from, and that you take these narratives seriously. You believe in what the Bible and the Book of Mormon are, t are teaching, and I agree also the importance on taking the Book of Mormon narratives, the Pearl of Great Price narratives, seriously on their own terms and providing a historical context. I mean, those are wonderful examples that Hugh Nibley left us of not only being intellectually rigorous, but intellectually honest and putting his neck out to say, I believe this. I, I think it's wonderful. Amen to that. You and I share one other story. Please do. I think, you know, I, I could talk about lots of favorite things in there, but one thing that comes to mind, maybe it's because of the... Um, political context we're living in right now. But I loved the way he also was willing to stake a claim on social and political issues that were unpopular. And, and he's got some great essays out there that talk about that. But one of the stories that Alex Nibley, his son, tells uh, in a, a chapter I'll, I'll reveal the title of in a little bit, uh, was especially touching to me. He tells about going with his father uh, to a Democratic uh, local meeting and that was a time when there was maybe a handful, maybe five or six Democrats in all of Provo, you'd, you'd think, from reading <laughs> them. And uh, the interesting thing about the story is both of them had in mind a certain candidate that, that they wanted for a local office. And so before the meeting started, and I may get some of the details of this wrong, but I'm, I'm telling it the way you tell folklore, but you sure. can get the real story from Alex in the, in the book. But um, they, they schmoozed a little bit with the people who were there and said, um, is it okay if we, we advance this person? We think he's a great guy. And everybody said, sure, we don't know anything about him. Just, just go ahead and we'll, we'll vote with you <laughs> since you're well informed. Anyway, the meeting started then and they got around to the time to vote. And, and essentially, Hugh looked around and said, well, isn't anybody going to speak for the other candidate? And uh, nobody budged. So he got up and he gave a lecture in favor of the other candidate. <laughs> <laughs> and he was so persuasive that in the end, Everybody voted for the other candidate. <laughs> Alex said to his dad, Dad, our candidate just lost. 
But the principal there was interesting. He was a man of integrity. And uh, he was a champion of lost causes sometimes, of which sometimes <laughs> I think, you know, sometimes we get close to that when we're trying to defend scripture. But uh, to me, he's a model in those social and temporal aspects. And I really appreciated that little story, maybe because of the times we're living in right now. That's remarkable. His uh, willingness to fight for lost causes, to make sure there was equal treatment and fair treatment for all. That's, that's remarkable. I love that. Well, any final thoughts about Hugh Nibley? No, I, I, except maybe to say I, I, we, we, we know that people who are uh, of my age or older will probably be very anxious to get this book, but I'm hoping that there'll be others uh, closer to your age um, and uh, uh, definitely a different generation will be willing to pick, pick it up and see just how much we have to gain from uh, looking not only at the works of Hugh Nibley, but also his life as a model. And the key, th key, th key thing about this book is I think it weaves the stories of the publications together with the story of his life. And the combination of those, I guess, again, I, I'm not the typical guy because I weave scholarship with my own life, but to me that's more powerful, again, than having scholarship or life stand alone. To me, this is uh, been a pleasure to work on, and I hope that many new friends of Hugh Nibley will be acquired through this book. I really hope so as well. As many of my generation are unfamiliar with Hugh Nibley's work, I hope this sparks some more interest. So thank you very much, Jeff Bradshaw, for joining us and sharing your experiences with Hugh Nibley and also your testimony of Jesus Christ. That was really wonderful. Thank you.